All right, well, um, first of all, I guess, welcome Laura to our, our seminars, to the Dias Astro seminars. Um, Laura um, did her PhD uh, with me, actually, and uh, finished up and went off to do a, uh, actually won an NPP, a NASA postdoctoral fellowship uh, to go and work at NASA Goddard. And she's been working on quasi-periodic pulsations. These are pulsations in solar flares and also uh, corresponding uh, uh, pulsations that are seen in the Earth's atmosphere. So we're continuing to, to collaborate, which is uh, great. And um, she's just recently gone back to DC for a brief visit and um, we'll be back in Ireland again soon enough. So, all right, Laura, um, it's over to you. Very welcome to you. And um, uh, we won't, I, I guess there's any urgent questions, people are, are welcome to put their hand up and, and ask questions during the seminar, but we'd probably better off to leave them, leave as many as possible to the end. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, and thanks everyone for having me and kind of listen to this talk. Uh, so just um, a bit of background. This is actually not the main focus of my research. And I don't think I've ever been actually funded to study the ionosphere. And this has always been a, a side project of mine. Um, and I said, like, as Peter said, I see solar flares and we kind of know there is a direct impact of the ionosphere. And when we were looking at these pulsations, the question was, well, well, can we see these pulsations in the ionosphere in the Earth's ionospheric response? And this kind of kind of opened a door to this kind of study of looking at solar flares and their effects on the Earth's ionosphere. So this talk would be kind of a, a high level talk really about solar flares and their effects on the Earth's ionosphere and really about the potential that is there to do this type of research. I think it's a kind of a problem in a in an interdisciplinary sense that solar physicists and ionospheric physicists don't really talk to each other. And it's really need to bridge that gap to kind of understand really the solar terrestrial connection um, uh, of these flare effects in the Earth's ionosphere. So I'm just kind of going to give a brief introduction to solar flares, um, just for those of you who are not particularly familiar with them or work on them. And then I'll talk about the ionosphere and kind of how solar flares can affect the ionosphere. And some of the recent, recent work that I've done and others have done and kind of where this, this uh, kind of research topic is going. Uh, so just to begin, when we're talking about space weather um, and kind of large eruptive events that occur in the sun and cause effects in the, uh, uh, in the Earth's near Earth environment, um, we usually talk about a solar eruptive event, which consists of both a solar flare, which is the radiation portion of the event, and then a coronal mass ejection, which is the ejection of plasma magnetic field away from the sun. And an awful lot of times in large events, these two things occur in tandem. Um, and both have a significant effect um, here on Earth. But for this talk and what I'm going to talk about, the Earth's ionosphere effects are, are really, we're going to talk about the solar flare, which is the radiation portion. So the increased electromagnetic radiation across um, essentially the whole electromagnetic spectrum um, by orders of magnitude. And these are really transient events. They don't occur that often, but when they do, they're really, really, really bright and kind of can increase the solar output by orders of magnitude, as I mentioned. And just from a prediction and space weather point of view, um, when you have a solar flare, when you see it, it's already happened. It's light, it comes, it takes around eight minutes to get to Earth. But with a coronal mass ejection, it takes time to propagate from the sun to the Earth. So you usually have a bit of time to, um, to kind of predict when it's going to arrive and how large it is and the effects that it might have. So from a prediction point of view, you really want to understand um, how kind of a solar flare is going to affect the ionosphere because it is, uh, can happen so quickly, essentially. So just um, how do we study solar flares? Um, we study solar flares by looking essentially at different um, emission from the sun. And the way we classify them is based on the, the GOES X-ray measurements. Um, so GOES uh, is a, a series of satellites that have been up since 1975, taking similar measurements for, for over um, several decades, essentially. So what we're showing here is broadband measurements in two X-ray wavelengths. Um, so this, the red one is 1 to 8 angstrom and the blue is 0 0.5 to 4. And we classify flares based on the peak flux in the 1 to 8 angstrom channel. So this is soft X-ray emission, looking at the full disk observation. So we can see that even during a flare, um, the full disk emission of X-ray from the sun can increase by orders of magnitude. And essentially, we classify them based on their peak flux, as I mentioned, and these are classified based on the scaling. So A, B, and C being small flares, and then M and X class flares are very, very large flares. So just to kind of give you some idea, when I talk about X-class flares or M-class flares, these are the large flares we're talking about, and these are the ones that have a significant impact on the Earth's ionosphere. In terms of how often do flares occur, here's a kind of a, a plot showing over the last kind of 33 years. Uh, the, each, each point here is a solar flare, and here is kind of that scale of goes peak. So this is kind of large solar flares and small solar flares. 
And we can see it follows a trend and this trend follows the solar cycle. Um, so this, the sun goes through cycles of, of maximum activity and minimum activity, depending on the magnetic field of the sun. So we can see this has kind of this, this nice trend. And looking at the occurrence rate of how often do they occur, um, we can focus on the last solar cycle and look at kind of a, a distribution of the number of flares that occurred. And we see that this follows a parallel spectrum, meaning that there are lots of little flares, as you might expect, and then very few large flares. So that's just something to take into account when we're talking about um, space weather effects and solar flare effects on the Earth's ionosphere. Um, now, some other kind of flare characteristics that might be important for this talk, like, so how long do solar flares occur? Um, they occur essentially from minutes to hours. They're not kind of very long duration events. Um, they don't occur for days, for example. Um, and here's just an example of kind of light curves or time series during a flare. Here is the soft X-ray emission, similar to what I showed earlier. This is looking at higher energy, hard X-ray emission um, up to kind of uh, 25 to 100 keV. And then this is looking at microwave radio emission. So it really is across the entire electromagnetic spectrum we're seeing kind of these um, features of a solar flare. Where do they occur? So essentially they occur in the most complex active regions on the sun. So also they can occur in quite small regions. So if you think about when we're talking about the X-ray flux can increase by several orders of magnitude, this is coming from quite a small region of the sun that is, in, that is then causing um, a, a solar output to increase in the whole disk by orders of magnitude. And I talked about solar eruptive events and the question is then, do solar flares always have an associated eruption? And the answer is no. However, for large flares, uh, it's, they're almost always associated with a coronal mass ejection. So here, if we look at X-class flares, it's almost 100% of X-class flares so show a, a coronal mass ejection. Now, when we're looking at solar flares, as I've kind of alluded to a few times, it really is a multi-wavelength phenomenon. So here again is a, a, a movie showing a solar flare in EUV from SDO AIA. Um, and you can see it's really, really bright in, um, in EUV, even bright enough so much to kind of saturate the detectors at some points. And here is just kind of a cartoon to kind of show the different structure of the standard model of a solar flare. And it really is from radio waves all the way up to gamma rays. We're seeing an increased solar output. Uh, we're seeing decimetric type three radio bursts. You might see, we see microwave emission and hard X-ray emission at the top of the loop. Um, and then we see this dominant soft X-ray and EUV emission that's really, really bright caused by this really, really heated plasma caused by the flare to evaporate into this loop that we see as this big bright structure. And kind of we also see hard X-ray and UV emission kind of down in the, the chromosphere at the lower atmosphere of the sun. So the takeaway point from here is that when you have a solar flare, which is a transient event, it occurs for minutes to, to several hours, these can drive the increased solar output. And I keep saying solar output because this is what really affects the Earth's ionosphere, because the Earth's ionosphere is essentially um, created and maintained by the solar output. So we need to be kind of understand how um, increases in the solar output will have effects of our Earth's own Earth's ionosphere. And to just give a snapshot of what this might look like, here is um, just looking at the UV portion of the spectrum from the sun. This is data from timed.se, um, just on a, on a particular day where there was no flare. Um, and this is looking at some wavelength and this is the spectrum. And um, we can see that there's different lines. Of course, you have the Lyman alpha line, which is the, the brightest line that we see from the sun. Um, However, when we have a solar flare, we can see that this actually increases by several orders of magnitude across the whole spectrum. Now, this is a, a log scale, so this is actually very, very large. And if we kind of look at the percentage increase during a flare, we can see that for most of kind of the, the, the EUV, it's, it, it's almost 100% increase. And when you go to extreme ultraviolet and when you continue on the spectrum up to X-rays, what you find is that this actually, uh, this is going up to 1,000, it goes up to 10,000, it can go orders of magnitude increase in the solar, uh, the solar output of the sun. So this is kind of a brief kind of introduction to solar flares, their, their characteristics. And now we're going to introduce, I guess, the, the Earth's ionosphere. So as I mentioned before, the Earth's ionosphere is the ionized portion of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, in terms of, of its altitude, it kind of begins at around 60, 60 kilometers um, up and kind of continues up to 1,000 kilometers in altitude. Um, it is essentially created and maintained by the solar output. And if we kind of look at the, the, the characteristics of the ionosphere, we can break it up into different regions depending on the electron density profile. So we have the D region, the E region, and the F region. And then we have the topside ionosphere, which is then dominated by the Earth's magnetic field. And how these different regions are divided are essentially due to the, the electron density profile, as I mentioned. And if we look at what this profile of the electron density looks like as a function of altitude, and um, we can look at this plot here. 
So this shows two things. It shows the ionosphere period both during the day and the night, and also shows it during the maximum when the, the sun is most active and when the, the sun is in its minimum or its, its lowest activity. So we can see the D region, the lowest lying region, uh, it's created during the day, but at nighttime, it almost completely disappears. Um, and we can see this bump in the, in the uh, electron density profile. And as we kind of move upwards, we go to the E region. Um, and this is kind of ionized essentially by EUV emission. This is the region of the ionosphere that was actually discovered by Marconi back in the, the early 1900s. And as we increase upwards, we can see we have this F region. This is where we have the potentially the largest portion of the ionosphere, the F region. And during the day, this is actually broken up into two portions, the F1 and the F2. But at nighttime, this just kind of goes into to one F region. So we can see these different portions of the ionosphere and how they're affected by day and night cycles. Now, why we kind of care about the ionosphere is that the ionosphere plays essentially a critical role in all transionospheric radio communication. So everything, any radio wave essentially has to propagate through the, the ionosphere and will be affected by it. So for example, any GPS satellites has to propagate through the ionosphere and this can be affected then by the electron density. And similarly, um, the ionosphere kind of uh, gives a pathway for high frequency radio communications where um, high frequency radio communications between three and 30 megahertz can essentially reflect in the kind of F regions of the ionosphere due to the electron density and propagate very, very large distances around the earth. So what we need to think about is that the critical frequency of, of when a radio wave is going to reflect is directly proportional to the electron density. So when you have a larger electron density in your ionosphere, it's going to affect how your radio waves propagate essentially, or what layers they're going to reflect on, or how much your signal is going to be essentially refracted, um, if you're thinking about actually transmitting through. As well as from a communication perspective, those of you who study um, radio astronomy, of course, has to be concerned about the conditions in the Earth's ionosphere, because if you are looking at the sun, for example, um, with a radio telescope, that signal is going to be propagated through the ionosphere. So if you're looking at kind of lower frequency signals in the lower megahertz region, um, you have to be kind of considerate of, of how your wave is going to be refracted within the Earth's ionosphere before you can observe it. Now, so then when you think about that during the day, the, the ionosphere is ionized by the sun, it's fairly stable, nothing much going on. However, when you have a solar flare, you have this increased orders of magnitude of X-rays and EUV radiation. And why this is important is that these X-rays and EUVs can penetrate down to the lowest lying regions of the Earth's ionosphere, particularly the D and the E regions, and increase the electron density there and in those locations by orders of magnitude. And why this is important from kind of a space weather perspective or kind of have, has adverse effects is that it can affect the, the, the propagation of these, ion, these radio waves. Uh, so for example, in terms of GPS satellites, it affects the total electron content in the Earth's ionosphere. So your radio waves can be um, refracted. It can also cause scintillation effects in your GPS signals where you have kind of bubbles of large electron density, which these signals get um, uh, affected by. But probably the most prominent one is high frequency radio communications um, that kind of bounce off the kind of upper E or F regions can actually be attenuated or in some cases uh, completely absorbed. So essentially you have a high frequency blackout due to a solar flare. And um, so this is important from kind of a space weather perspective. We want to understand how, the, how this is going to affect the Earth's ionosphere electron density and how long is it going to last? How long does it take to recombine back and kind of go back to its normal state? So in terms of, of what the solar flare impacts look like in the data we observe from the Earth, um, here are just kind of three snapshots I'll show. One of them is that we can actually observe solar flare effects in ma ground-based magnetometer data. And this is probably the, the earliest example of, of showing of this. This is the Carrington event um, back in the 1800s. Um, and this is ground-based magnetometer data. So this was the flare itself. So we see these kind of features that are known as a crochet. Um, essentially, I think the term came from a crochet needle, uh, which kind of looks like this. So we can see kind of crochet signatures in magnetometer data. And then, of course, this happened when the flare, and then this was then the, the corona mass ejection that followed that large flare. So just, just one thing to remember, I guess, that you can see these in ground-based magnetometer data. If we look at total electron content um, maps, essentially, from GPS receivers, um, we can see that on the dayside ionosphere, you have significantly increased total electron content. Um, in the Earth's ionosphere. So we can use kind of TEC maps to understand um, how the electron content can be increased, uh, but that's much more higher in the ionosphere you'd be looking at. And then in terms of kind of the lower lying regions and high frequency radio absorption, this is an idea of, this is um, a model produced by NOAA, the D region absorption model, which looks at how, how, um, how much high frequency radio waves are absorbed 
caused by solar flares. So this is affected, of course, in the dayside ionosphere again. Now, just to give a case study of maybe sometimes this has really had a, a significantly adverse effect on Earth. If we look at the 2017 um, solar storm, so these are the two largest flares of the past solar cycle, uh, showing these are the GOES plots here. So we can see there, there was an X9 and an X10, or an X8. Um, and what happened was these actually occurred um, during the day and there was a significantly disturbed D region in the ionosphere. And why this is important is that these actually occurred at the same time of the really bad Caribbean storms, both Hurricanes Irma and Jose. So they almost lined up exactly when these storms occurred. And why this was, um, why this had a significant effect was essentially people were really reliant on high frequency communications at this time, um, especially, especially emergency responders because a lot of um, other telecommunication signals were down due to the, the, um, the hurricanes. And it actually was showed that during this large flare, there was actually a French aviation aircraft that lost communications with the ground for over 90 minutes uh, because of these solar storms. So this is a really kind of an adverse effect that, that solar flares can have. And people really do think about space for the effects. They think of the corona mass ejection and the follow on effects of that, but it, it really is solar flares that can also have a significant effect. So again, this is really the D region that has the most effect. And this is because the X-rays are the largest emission that just dominates um, ionization in the lowest lying regions. So when we really want to understand solar flare effects, we really want to look at the D region. And just to kind of give a brief introduction to the D region, as I said, it's the lowest lying region. It, it is formed during the day by Lyman alpha emission acting on nitric oxide, which is kind of a minor um, constitute in, in the D region. The D region is dominated essentially by negative ions um, and a lot of neutral density. So recombinations are very, very high. However, when you have a solar flare, oh, sorry, Maybe I'll show you here again. This is just to point out that Lyman alpha is the most dominant line um, from the sun. And this is what ionizes the D region. But when you have a solar flare, in particular kind of wavelengths that are less than around one nanometer, these ionize the dominant particles. So O2 and N2. And this just completely overtakes the, the ionization and increases the electron density by orders of magnitude. So one thing about the D region is that it's kind of an awkward altitude. It's too high for balloons and it's, it's too low for satellites. So we actually can't go and directly measure the electron density in the D region. And we need to kind of use remote sensing techniques to try to identify variations in the, the, the D region um, ionosphere. And particularly it has a very complicated chemistry that we really don't have a grasp on yet. But one way we can really easily essentially um, identify the electron density variations in the D region is by using the propagation of very low frequency radio waves. So very low frequency radio waves from three to 30 kilohertz and um, propagate in the waveguide form between the Earth um, and the D region. So that they, were, they essentially bounce off um, the D region altitudes. So during the day, the propagation of VLF radio waves is, is fairly stable. We have kind of um, a good idea of what it should look like and both the amplitude and phase kind of hold information about the conditions of the D region. The Earth's um, conductivity doesn't change, um, but the, the upper atmosphere or the D region does change. So essentially what we're seeing, if we see any anomalies here that in the amplitude or phase, you're essentially seeing variations in the conductivity profile of the D region, which reflects the electron density essentially. So when you have a solar flare, what you have is that the electron density increases. We have that this altitude actually comes down slightly and the profile of the conductivity increases. And essentially what we can do is we can, we can look at, as I said, look at the amplitude and phase, and this is, holds information about the electron density and kind of the, the recombination coefficients and things like that. And how we kind of, how do you observe VLF waves? Well, luckily there's actually um, uh, an awful lot of worldwide antennae that are transmitting very low frequency radio waves up to me one megawatts uh, across the globe. And these are transmitting these continuously to actually communicate with submarines. Um, so an awful lot of this work was actually done in the 60s during kind of the Cold War, um, where people were really trying to understand the propagation effects of VLF radio waves. So we can make use of these large transmitters that are continuously transmitting VLF signals and identify the, both the phase and amplitude, as I said again, to kind of identify the electron density and collision of frequency in the D region. So with a relatively cheap, just at the, um, this is an antenna that was then burr and made of essentially just um, some pipe and some wire. And use kind of, um, this is a SID box. So this is the old box that we used to have, which essentially just receives amplitude and phase. Oh, sorry, just amplitude. Um, we, can, we can look at how the variations in the D region are affected throughout the day. So just to kind of give you an idea, these things cost around 100 euro. It's a very cheap um, um, 
instrumentation, but actually there's an awful lot of information that can be gained. So what does this look like? If we look at a quiet day and we look at the VLF amplitude over this path, so we're looking at a transmitter that is transmitting from Maine in the US and we're receiving it in Burr, Ireland. So during the day, there's, this is the sunrise and sunset, um, but during a quiet day profile, the VLF signal should just look like this. You can kind of see a diurnal effect essentially as the sun is going up above and overhead. Um, and we can see when this is kind of a day where there is absolutely no flares. The VLF signal, as I said, is quite predictable. However, when you have solar flares, we are actually able to identify these in the amplitude of the VLF signal. So here we can almost see each of these individual flares picked up as amplitude peaks um, in the VLF signal. So essentially what we're having is over this path, we are using the ionosphere as a giant X-ray detector, which is kind of really neat if you think about it. It's really only a hundred year detector and we're able to pick up solar flares. And just to kind of give you an idea of, of, of what people have done in the past for this and why this is kind of really interesting is this is an example uh, from Thompson 2003 when there was a, such a large solar flare that the x-ray detector, uh, the GOES x-ray detector actually saturated because the flare was so large. So we didn't have a good idea of how large that flare actually was in terms of its, its magnitude or classification. However, the Earth's ionosphere can't saturate, for example, right? So you can look at, this is, this is actually looking at the phase of a VLF transmitter. And we can see that the peak, we can actually see the whole flare. And from this, we can then extrapolate to how large that flare actually was. And using that, we're able to estimate that the, the, the flare was essentially an X45, which is one of the largest flares in recent years. So it goes to the question, can you calibrate the ionosphere? Or how sensitive is the ionosphere to these solar flares? And this is some work that Oscar is doing at the moment. Oscar O'Hara, who's a, a final year student at Trinity, uh, working with Peter and at Dias where we use kind of the, the data that we had from the last solar cycle from that VLF receiver in Burr. And if we look at the peak amplitude of, of the, the amplitude of these flares we identify in the, the VLF receiver and the X-ray flux, we can see that there is kind of a nice correlation going on, such that higher flux, uh, you have an overall increase in the, the, the amplitude. Um, so that was kind of an introduction of how we study solar flares uh, in the D region and kind of I'm going to introduce now a study I did actually during my PhD to look at how, how, how kind of closely down can we probe the ionosphere and how sensitive is it to, to ionizing radiation. So this is kind of a study looking at pulsations in the Earth's ionosphere. So as I said before, my kind of focus is looking at these quasi-periodic pulsations in solar flares. And the question then arose, well, we know the Earth's ionosphere is very sensitive and we now have a way to, to probe the, the ionosphere as if, um, during flares. But can we see these pulsations? How sensitive is it? And so we went out actually just looking for events for which we could see this, and we actually found a really nice one. So what we have here, this is the GOES X-ray flux. So we can see it kind of has these nice pulsations of a period of around 20 minutes. And what we have here, this is the uh, EUV emission over kind of the active region, and this is the light curve from that EUV emission. What we have down here is actually the, the VLF amplitude as a function of time. So we're seeing that what we've actually identified is quasi-periodic pulsations in the electron density variations in the Earth's ionosphere driven by solar flare pulsations. Um, I think this is a movie. Yeah, so we can see as a function of time, this kind of almost region on the sun pulsating. And why this is interesting is like we were able to see exactly pulsating loops on the sun that are having a direct impact and quasi-periodically driving electron density variations in the Earth's ionosphere. Another thing to note is if we look in at each individual peak, we can see there is a slight time delay between the X-ray ionizing radiation and the ionospheric response. And this delay isn't to do like isn't a timing delay because GOES is at um, geosynchronous orbit, so it, the, the time delay is, is it would be very short there. This is actually due to the recombination processes that occur um, in the D region. So when you have ionizing radiation, there's an awful lot of processes that need to go on before it can settle down. And I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. If we look again at the D region absorption model over this event, um, so this was probing the ionosphere over this region, we can actually see that over the day side ionosphere, the electron density variations were actually pulsating, again, driving quasi periodic um, electron density variations and affecting uh, high frequency radio communications over this region, um, which is something that people hadn't actually really seen before. And it's really kind of interesting. Moving on, we've, we've looked at, if we look again at this, this is looking at VLF amplitude, but how do you go from VLF amplitude to actually get a quantitative measure of the electron density? This is giving us a qualitative measure of that there are variations in the electron density, but what are those actual variations in terms of numbers of, um, in terms of the electron density? So one way we can do this is, is using this long wave propagation capability software. 
Um, and what this does is it models the propagation of VLF radio waves, essentially using waveguide mode theory. Um, so what we have essentially is that the, the VLF propagates in a waveguide form between the Earth's and the, the ionosphere D region. And we can essentially quantify um, these waveguide propagation based on the conductivity profiles. So we have very good maps on Earth of what the conductivity profile should look like as a function of distance. Um, and in the Earth's ionosphere, we then are going to, to make this kind of simple, it's a bit, the, the ionospheric D region is quite complicated. We're essentially going to use these two parameters to describe the conductivity profile in the Earth's uh, a D region, or the ionospheric D region. And these two parameters are H prime, which is essentially the effective reflection height, which can change, as I said, when you have ionizing radiation. And this beta term, which is essentially the, the sharpness of the profile. Um, so we're using essentially an exponential conductivity profile. And using these two together, then we can we can model that the the the, the waveguide propagation of these 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 frequency waves. And when we're able to do that, we're actually able to determine these H prime and beta values based on this kind of propagation model. And what we find is, as you might expect, that the H prime or the, the reflecting height actually varies as a function of time. So during high ionizing radiation, the, the, the reflecting height actually moves down and the conductivity profile actually increases. And then using that, we can use this equation, which is somewhat empirically determined, um, to estimate what the electron density um, values are as a function of, of height. And this is what, what is done here. So we use these values of H prime and beta in this equation to get kind of a profile of the electron density as a function of altitude and as a function of time. And if we look here, these are just three slices through three different altitudes. We're seeing again, as you would expect these pulsations, but if you look at the actual numbers, we're seeing electron density variations um, over an order of magnitude during this flare, um, which again, just really highlighting that they are driving quasi-periodic electron density variations. Um, in the ionosphere. Another interesting aspect we can look at when we have a flare with multiple pulsations, we can do some other interesting things. If we look at this, if we want to kind of make use of this time delay, we can look at the, uh, the continuity equation essentially of the electron density uh, in the D region. And this is dependent on the electron gain, which is the ionizing radiation and the loss. Um, so this, is, this term here is called the effective recombination coefficient. It takes into account all the different types of recombination that can occur in the D region, which includes like electron ion uh, recombination, ion ion recombination, and three body recombination. In terms of the, the continuity equation, we don't need to worry about transport effects in the D region just due to the, the high neutral density that is there. But kind of looking at this equation and kind of Taylor expanding about any, we can we can make a kind of a determination of this recombination coefficient. And this recombination coefficient can then be described in terms of the electron density and also in terms of this time delay. Um, so now we have two measurable components. We have now been able to measure the electron density using the long waveguide propagation capability code. And we now have different points of time delay between these peaks. So this essentially, um, because as Taylor expanded about, it's, it's essentially only um, valid at the peak of, of each of these pulsations. So usually when you study a flare, you only get one data point because you only have one peak. But with these pulsations, we were able to get it for various peaks. And we're able to estimate this, this recombination coefficient. And doing that, we actually looked at the, we can get a, a, a plot of the recombination coefficient as a, as a, as a, a function of flux, um, which hasn't been able to be done before. Again, for an individual flare, you usually have to do statistics on, on many different flares. And this is again, looking at different altitudes. So what we're seeing is that the recombination um, coefficient essentially decreases as a function of flux, um, which in, is important in itself um, for, for modelers that would be interested in this. Um, and why it decreases essentially is that the, the increased flux essentially reduces the number of hydrated ions and, um, and clusters that are in the D region, these co complex uh, chemistry that is there, uh, allowing for things to kind of be recomb like so it reduces the, the recombination essentially. So I guess maybe some, some takeaways from that is that um, it really just shows the sensitivity of the ionosphere. And I think showing that there are pulsations in the Earth's ionosphere is important and something to look into further because if this has, if these pulsations, if you have something um, oscillatory driving the Earth's ionospheric electron density, this can have resonances for other waves that are occurring in the Earth's uh, ionosphere, which maybe kind of can have a, a stronger geophysical effect of a solar flare and something that really needs to be taken into account further. And that study kind of really, uh, you know, I, I gave that talk at, at, at different conferences and I really was trying to open the, the eyes of solar physicists to say, this is really important. We should be looking more about how 
not just of the peak flux of a solar flare, but different aspects of a solar flare and how that can affect the Earth's ionosphere. And this leads on to kind of this next topic, which is not all flares are created equal. So a lot of studies have maybe, as I said, looked at just the, the peak dose flux and related that to how the ionosphere um, was affected. However, the peak flux isn't necessarily um, the best metric for what a solar flare looks like. So you said you have um, emission across the whole electromagnetic spectrum and some flares have kind of different EUV spectra. They have different hard X-ray spectra. And we need to kind of get a better understanding of how this, each of those spectra and each of those different components of a solar flare can have a geophysical effect on Earth. And this is some recent study that was led by Ryan Milligan where he was looking at Lyman and alpha impacts um, on the Earth's ionosphere. So as I said, you usually would say that it was usually thought that Lyman and alpha had a really dominant effect during solar quiet times. It was those that created the, um, the, the D region, for example, but during a flare, the Lyman alpha increase isn't th that much overall compared to its usual time. And it wasn't really thought to have any effect uh, compared to the soft X-ray or EUV emission. But this was an event that showed a very strong signature in Lyman alpha, which is this black plot here. Um, and then the red plot is the GOES flux. So this is the X-ray flux. The green plot here is actually looking at magnetometer data. So this is looking at the crochet, as I mentioned before, in magnetometer data. And then this is the VLF data, right? So now we're having, if we think of the magnetometer data and the VLF data as aspects of looking at the Earth's ionosphere, there is a significant time delay there. And what's even more interesting is if we kind of zoom in and look at the different time profiles, this black line shows the impulsive Lyman alpha emission that occurs, which very closely matches the, the, the BZ in, um, instantaneous uh, observation. So this is the magnetometer data. And then we have the GOES flux and then we have the VLF flux. So this is saying, okay, well, why is there a difference there? So if we're thinking of magnetometer data showing flare signatures, this is occurring higher up in the ionosphere. This is occurring in the E region. Um, so essentially by using kind of VLF and magnetometer data, we can probe different regions of the Earth's ionosphere. And what this is showing is, well, if, given that the, the, the kind of increase in magnetometer data is actually occurring before the X-ray emission, it's suggesting that the dominant ionization that's occurring at this higher level isn't from the X-rays and it's actually closely matching this Lyman alpha emission. So I guess it, it raises some really important questions of how do flares of different spectral properties affect the Earth's ionospheric response? And I think this study really opens the door to kind of, we need to look at this in more detail. We need to look at what is, is it the Lyman alpha emission exactly that is ionizing that portion of the ionosphere? Um, we know that Lyman alpha affects nitric oxide and there is some nitric oxide in the E region. And is that what is occurring here? Or maybe there is another, EUV line that we're not really taking into consideration that it's affecting the upper uh, regions of the Earth's um, uh, ionosphere. I'm kind of focusing in on this and looking at some other flares. This is um, some recent study I did where I went back and looked at the BIRD data for both VLF signals and ground-based magnetometer data, which are co-located in BIRD. And this is a snapshot of a day, which, which shows kind of an, what I've been trying to highlight. This here is the GOES flux. So we can see we have two flares that occurred um, quite close to each other. They have almost identical peak uh, GOES flux. So they'd be classified as the same um, magnitude of flare. If we look at the Lyman alpha emission from this, this, uh, this same event, we can see the first flare only had a tiny contribution of the overall Lyman alpha emission. But the, the second flare had a very large component of a Lyman alpha emission. If we look at the magnetometer data, again, this kind of goes to show, for this flare, same magnitude, basically no um, essentially signatures we see in the magnetometer data, maybe reflecting the kind of small effects we see in Lyman alpha. However, for the flare that had a long, large Lyman alpha um, contribution, we can see we have this crochet effect in the, the magnetometer data. And again, if we look at the VLF, as you would expect, it nicely shows these two flares, similar magnitude, which matches the soft X-ray. So again, what we're seeing is if we look, if we kind of zoom in on this individual flare, we can see that Lyman alpha peaks first, as does the magnetometer data. And then we have the soft X-ray and then we have the VLF. So it really kind of, again, highlights the need to look at the different spectral components of the flare and compare and see how these do affect um, the, the Earth's ionosphere. So I think there's an awful lot of work to be done. Um, and what does that really look like in particular? I think we need to start looking at more individual flares and looking from, as a solar physicist, we need to understand, say, the, the different aspects of the flare itself and what's interesting about that. And then we need to work with ionospheric physicists to really probe the different regions of the ionosphere. Um, and I think even from a, a simple starting point is looking at 
uh, co-located VLF um, and magnetometer data to kind of probe these different regions of the ionosphere to kind of get a better control over what's going on. And just to kind of give kind of a, a bigger picture view of this, um, it's not just the Earth's ionosphere that is affected by solar flares. Um, the Martian ionosphere is actually quite similar in profile to the Earth's ionosphere. And it is similarly significantly affected by X-ray and EUV radiation. So this is some work in 2006, which looked at kind of a large X cluster. Um, and this was, they were able to kind of probe at the electron density profiles. So this is similar to a plot I showed before, uh, where you can see the different regions. And during a flare, we have kind of orders of magnitude increase um, so we can see at the lowest lying region, similar to Earth, we have um, over 200% increase in the electron density variations. And moving forward, um, MAVEN, which is a really interesting um, instrument, actually has some space weather instruments on board. It actually has a Lyman Alpha um, instrument that is detecting Lyman Alpha emission from the sun, which is something we really need to use as solar physicists. Um, and again, this was uh, the September flare, similar to those ones I showed that had effects in the Caribbean. And this is looking at the, the photo ionization rate in the Martian ionosphere. And again, you can see it's these lowest lying regions that are affected by um, solar flares. So I think by using, we, we kind of live in an age where there is so much data and we just need to have communities talk to each other. I think we could do studies where we look at one solar flare and see how it affected the Earth's ionosphere and how it affected the Martian ionosphere, look at the different time delays. And maybe this will help us even probe further down into kind of um, use, use kind of, uh, sophisticated techniques to try to understand the response of the Martian ionosphere and maybe can kind of help us in that sense. Ooh. Sorry, so yeah, so just looking forward and, and as we approach the next solar cycle, what are the prospects for this? And I guess this is kind of a reach out for anybody interested. There's so much data, I think there's an awful lot of low hanging fruit here. Um, so this is just again, this is the last solar cycle, this is predicted solar cycle. We're now kind of in the ramp up of the new solar cycle. In terms of prospects of new data, um, I know Peter and Oscar have been working to put up two new antennae, both in Dunsink and in Burr. And these antennae are interesting. They have a new, diff a new different type of uh, SID receiver or a sudden ionospheric disturbance receiver, which can actually pick up from multiple, multiple transmitters around the world. So here's just a map of what this might look like if you pick up from these different VLF transmitters. And essentially, you can then probe different portions of the ionosphere. So at the moment of the past solar cycle, we only had data across the path from Maine to Ireland. But now we can kind of look over Europe and we can look south and north. Um, so I think this is, this is really exciting. And I know that data is up and running. So now we just need some flares to happen to kind of get some um, new data. I think, again, having co-located magnetometer data, I know there's um, Maggie network in Ireland, I think we need to utilize that more for looking at flares. Um, and just to go back to the catalog even for the last solar cycle and try to look at the GOES flare list and see how many of those flares showed this crochet signature. And I think even if some don't, the question is why don't they show crochet, crochet, crochet signature? Um, and I think there's also kind of uh, a lot of new solar instruments, particularly looking at the EV spectrum, uh, which would give us some really nice uh, spectra as a function of time, which then we can use to compare with the ionospheric response. So again, I think what we need to do is to be able to utilize diverse data sets and really perform inter interdisciplinary studies uh, between heliospheric communities. Um, I think, again, this study highlights the need for that. Um, and I think we can actually do much more as a community if we, if we work together. And just kind of to the, the final kind of messages and conclusions of this talk and some takeaway messages. Um, Solar flares have direct impact on the Earth's ionospheric conditions. And this really does affect the lowest lying conditions, particularly the D and the E region. Um, and why this is important is it can have significant effects on high frequency radio communications and essentially any trans ionospheric communications or radio astronomy that are looking in kind of the megahertz range. Um, we've kind of shown that uh, solar quasi-periodic pulsations can have essentially drive geophysical impacts um, into the ionospheric conditions and drive periodic electron density variations. And I think more work needs to be done here to look for other events and try to see, does it have a stronger geophysical effect if there are these pulsations? Does it resonate with other kind of processes that occur in the Earth's ionosphere? I think analyzing solar flare effects can really help us kind of uh, understand the adverse effects of space weather. For example, are all flares created equal? Are some flares going to have more of a geophysical impact? Is it going to take longer for the ionosphere to come back to normal? Uh, depending on the flare spectra. That's something we don't have a good handle on yet. As I said, it's only really looking at the classific classification based on GOES peaks. Um, again, there's much more work to be done looking at spectral components, even looking at just the X-ray portion of, the, of, um, of uh, 
the flare and how that affects the Earth's ionosphere. And again, I think communities need to talk more. And I think we're living in a, an era rich with data, even from the past solar cycle. Um, and there's an awful lot of work to be done. Um, so that's all I have to say. I hope um, it was interesting and I'm happy to have some discussion or take any questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Laura. That was excellent. Um, very clear and lots of uh, questions in my mind. Um, maybe I'll kick off uh, the questions. Um, the link between the, the crochet time profile and um, the Lyman alpha, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a very close connection. It's very abrupt. And yeah. the physical link as to why that would be is hard um, to understand, I think, because, yeah. you know, photons illuminate the ionosphere and so ionization increases. You get a current which creates a magnetic field and then that's picked up by the magnetometers. Is that the physical linkage that, that you believe is, 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 is going on? Um, yeah, so I think it is just that different. I, um, yeah, I think it is just that you're having kind of different uh, EUV radiations that are, occur more impulsively before the soft X-ray emission that is ionizing higher regions of, of the Earth's ionosphere, particularly the, the, elect, the E region. Um, and that's why we're seeing this magnetometer signatures first, because when we're seeing the magnetometer signatures, mm. that is essentially looking at the E region uh, currents, right? So if you have increased electron density, that's going to affect how the currents of, are in the E region. And then we're seeing this, this, this spike in the magnetometer data. Um, okay, so, so I, I guess that's where I'm trying to get to is, um, I tend to think D region, but you're mentioning E region there. So do you think that like the the most dramatic change in currents is, is higher up than the D region? Yeah, exactly. So I think yeah. you don't really have, due to the low neutral density or the high neutral density, sorry, in the D region, it, it isn't really dominated. There are no currents really there. Um, it's dominated by neutral densities and negative ions. There's not much current going on. It's really the E region where you have this ionospheric current. Um, yeah. So while you have kind of a large increase in the electron density in the D region, it's, it doesn't even get to as high as the E region electron density. It's just overall much higher. Uh, compared to what it was. But that's x-rays then that's doing that. That's yeah, so that's exactly. So that's x-rays and x-rays affect the lower region. It doesn't really have too much of an effect on the E region, just compared to what uh, the kind of constitutes that are there. Okay, okay very good. Uh, I think I saw Owen's hand up there. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Laura. It was really interesting, really clear. Um, I had a, a question on the time scales of the variability because the pulsations or over time scales of minutes, tens of minutes. Yeah. How fast can it be? Can you see pulsations at less than a minute or is just the response and the recombination and so on just too slow for that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's what we were actually originally looking for. Um, the problem mainly is that the, the variations of, of flux that kind of are in shorter time scales don't have large enough flux increases. So the, the amplitude of shorter time scales are much lower. So it, it's kind of a combination of having large enough modulation to identify them. You really shouldn't see things lower than around, um, I would say, 30 seconds. Um, but if you really did have kind of soft X-ray emission that went up and came back down over the period of a minute, you should be able to identify it. Uh, I think within this, there would be, again, some time delay and you wouldn't see essentially um, a kind of clear up and down. It might be up and then it was more of a slowdown. Um, uh, this kind of second part related to that then if I am doing low frequency radio astronomy yeah and I see source my source dancing around on time scales of greater than 30 seconds say it's probably due to the ionosphere um but say if you see the source variability uh on time scales of 10 seconds or less is that too fast for the ionosphere meaning it's not the ionosphere that's causing that variability yeah, so I guess with the uh, affecting kind of say megahertz range, you would be more affected by uh, the total electron content higher up in the ionosphere. Yeah. Um, and in terms of that, I don't, I mean, because it's not just solid, there can be kind of like essentially different kind of bubbles of electron density that can actually move around higher up in the ionosphere. Um, and maybe that is what you're seeing, but I honestly don't really know what the shortest time scale would be in that sense. Um, so do you mean like you might have a source that moves like significantly over that time? 
Um, yeah, it's it's sort of related to work that we're doing with Chilpi and uh, her when a colleague noted that the, the variability in the source positions changes on timescales of seconds. Yeah. And he was saying that um, this is too fast for the ionosphere. Um, if you, uh, you know, the ionosphere would probably produce variability on 10 seconds or more, you know? Yeah. And that the variability you see is probably coronal. The, 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 the dancing of the source is real, you know, not, not ionospheric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I would expect that the ionosphere caused by solar flare effects would be kind of, you wouldn't expect it, you would expect it to be more gradual in a sense. You wouldn't expect mm -hmm. it just to jump from one electron density to the next really quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, very so I think maybe for different types of effects, kind of higher latitudes, you can get different, there are different things come into effect because you have kind of precipitation of, of high energy particles, which can, can, can have different effects. Um, but if you're looking at kind of mid latitudes, I think it, it should be, and, and caused by a flare, um, things shouldn't change that rapidly. Um, they should increase, but not by uh, a jump, if you, if you, if you will. I think um, one thing to take home is that uh, it's a really hard one for us solar radio astronomers is that when you're trying to make images of sorry did um you just stopped sharing your slides right yeah sorry yeah. Uh, it's what when you you know when when you're trying to image say cmes or radio bursts or whatever it's the very time where the ionosphere isn't well behaved it's yeah uh, you know when there's c-class flares going off and m-class flares going off the ionosphere is very is very um disturbed so it's not a good time for imaging um, but also, you know, to relate to Owen's question, he was talking about timescales, but there's also amplitude variabilities in these events. You know, the ionosphere is extremely sensitive to even the smallest scale variability in, in GOES X-rays or, or Lyman Alpha. So, you know, that, and, and I don't think we still know how, how, how sensitive it actually is. So there's still some work to be done there, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I think it's like the idea that you need to essentially calibrate it, right? You need to calibrate the entire ionosphere. Um, at the moment, we're just comparing, you know, over a large path, goes flux with that. But if you really want to calibrate it, you might need to look at things like, you know, modeling tools like Giant and then compare it to the X-ray spectra and try to get a better idea of how it is responsive. Um, yeah, I think a lot of work can be done in that regard. Yeah, the um, the magnetometer area, I from my searching of the literature is really unexplored. So I think that's a whole new area in there. Any other questions from people? I have a question. Um, Go ahead. So um, we hear about like the sun affecting the ionosphere constantly, but does like human like impact like cities and stuff um, like basically, yeah, human interaction, like the power grids, does that affect the ionosphere to to a certain degree um i i don't think so um because you wouldn't have essentially strong ionizing radiation in kind of those wavelengths that would have, would come upwards uh, and affect the earth's ionosphere um but just jumping on that uh, other effects from earth that can affect the ionosphere and people have detected these in vlf signals is that people have been able to say i'm not entirely sure about this but you can detect earthquakes in vlf signals because it essentially sends a shock wave upwards and it affects um, electron density variation small, like kind of essentially a pressure gradient uh, in the lower ionosphere, which you can detect if you look really clearly at VLF signals when nothing is going on in the sun. Um, so that would be kind of the only Earth-based thing. In terms of other ionizing radiation from space, you can have cosmic rays, of course, can, can have a significant effect uh, on the Earth's ionosphere. Uh, they've detected gamma rays in the Earth's ionosphere. Another thing, sorry, of course, is lightning um, is significantly uh, can be identified in the Earth's ionosphere, essentially in VLF broadband observations where you see these kind of like, uh, I think they're called sprint or something, um, as that is ionizing radiation. Um, but yeah, I don't think anything man-made can cause uh, effects in the ionosphere. Well, the, the, there's one that a nuclear radio- uh, Oh, sorry, a, yeah. A nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. A nuclear bomb can affect the ionosphere and it's been seen in, in the past, especially in air burst. But um, uh, that's that's one thing that affects VLF. But yeah. um, and I mean that was one of the first re reasons that people started looking at solar flares and set up space weather operation centers. That it was difficult to distinguish between a solar flare and a nuclear de de detonation in the Earth's ionosphere. And of course, the military care about the, the ionosphere for their radio communications. But just on the um, 
uh, earthquake uh, point there, uh, there was a paper published, uh, I think it was on archive this week by a Japanese group who are looking at who were looking at earthquakes and maybe even volcan volcanic eruptions and uh, they can see that in the VLF data as well. But I think it's more that there's a, a, a charge distribution at the boundary between uh, sliding faults and that causes an electric field and consequently affects up in the ionosphere. Oh, interesting, yeah. But I think it's um, I think it's uh, it's an open question in many ways. All right. Uh, I have a quick one, Laura. Uh, thanks for the talk; it was really, really good. Um, do you know you're saying that the main, obviously, the main effect in the in the change in your signal is due to the ionosphere? Have you any idea of whether, like, so the path from Burr to Maine is over water? Have you any idea what effect you'd have if you're looking over Europe or? whatever, if it's over land, or is it just that the Earth's surface is so much flatter than however high up into the ionosphere you go? Yeah, that's actually a great question, Pierce. Um, so it, it's all based on, essentially, if you're looking at it as a waveguide, um, it depends on the conductivity profile. So the conductivity profile in the sea is going to be, of course, an awful lot different to on land. Um, and I guess it really just depends on uh, the VLF amplitude can, I mean, if you look at, say, um, if you look at if you have a receiver in Ireland, for example, and you look at, say, uh, amplitudes from many different stations, they all look slightly different, but you can kind of always get that overall trend. And it might be kind of changed in amplitude overall, but the, the diurnal trend and the flare peaks will be um, essentially the same. And what that long waveguide capability code that I was talking about actually takes into consideration all of those different conductivity profiles on Earth. Um, and then I think when you can have shorter paths, so from here, from Burr to Maine, as a very long path, so you can kind of look at it as a waveguide where you have lots of different modes coming together. But over shorter paths, you need to look at kind of a ray hop because you might only have several kind of bounces essentially from a shorter distance from say France to Ireland. Um, it's not, you don't have this time for all these wave modes to sum, you're essentially just looking at the, the ray pattern. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. I kind of went on a, a bit of a rant. I think so. It was interesting anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we've time for another. Any? any I have uh, one question. Go ahead. Um, um, thanks, Laura. It was a really good talk. Um, just kind of following on from the work of um, Ryan Milligan. So it seems the magnetometer, the Lyman Alpha, the VLF, and I'm missing something else. I suppose goals as well. X-ray flux. They're all showing signatures. Do you think there's other signatures that we could look into. Um, Do you mean from like a flare perspective or from? Yeah, yeah, like other measurements. Do you have any inkling of other other avenues that could possibly show so signatures that you could combine with those? Yeah, exactly. So I think well, myself and Ryan have been talking about this a lot and we're kind of coming up with this hypothesis that the geoeffectiveness of a flare is essentially um, directly inputted by the distributed of accelerated electrons in a flare, right? And that's going to have an impact on what your X-ray spectrum looked like and what your EUV spectrum looked like. When we looked at Lyman Alpha, I mean, that study was really because Ryan was doing a study on Lyman Alpha emission. Um, but if you have a, a very large increase in Lyman Alpha, you're going to have a very large increase in many, many different EUV wavelengths. So I think what you need to do is not just look at individual wavelengths, which we've been doing, looking at GOES and looking at Lyman Alpha. We need to look at it as a spectrum. So going back to that plot I had, which showed kind of the UV spectrum, looking at that as a function of time and seeing how that compares to um, the ionosphere. So we really need to look at a full zone approach, like looking at a flare in particular, looking at kind of a tech space factor, the amount of energy in it, what lines are dominant and how that compares to say, whether there is a magnetometer response, does it affect how the VLF signal uh, is affected and things like that. Um, so I think, yeah, just looking at more wavelengths essentially from the flare and what different characteristics from the flare have an Im impact um, um, on the Earth's ionosphere. And people haven't done many studies of individual flares. It's really been kind of statistical studies. And this again goes back to this community is not talking. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I think from terms of Lyman Alpha, like Lyman Alpha during a flare doesn't have an overall uh, large increase compared to what it was, but it's still quite large. And Lyman Alpha line is so bright that it's an awful lot of energy still is within that line. Um, so the idea was really like, how much does that actually affect the ionosphere where really before it wasn't thought to, but it now looks like it might. Um, 
Uh, so I think it just needs to look at different EUV lines in particular and see how they affect essentially different regions of, of uh, the ionosphere. That's great. It's really interesting. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, um, let's thanks Laura again, or thank Laura again, and um, uh, keep up the good work. Looks great. And uh, thank you everybody else for coming and um, wishing you well in DC, Laura. Hope all go goes well there. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Um, it was good to talk to you all and see you all. Well, virtually. I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Laura.